The province of Manitoba today will start validating its first shipment of that, the first coronavirus testing device that it's getting in to make sure it works. We showed you it yesterday. It's called the Spartan Cube, made in Canada by Spartan Bioscience, approved by Health Canada over the weekend. It's portable, size of a coffee cup, and it promises fast results. So health authorities in remote areas are eager to get their hands on this handheld device for testing. If the test has to travel from remote communities to Yellowknife and then down to Alberta, it really puts us behind. It's probably going to be a game changer. The earlier we identify that there is a virus that's crept into a long-term care facility, the better we can then pre prevent it from spreading to other others. As I mentioned, Manitoba is starting to validate its shipment, but it's going to roll out this week in several parts of the country. Uh, the federal government has put it in order for 40,000 tests a month. Alberta and Ontario are also planning to use it to ramp up their testing capabilities. The company says there's global demand for the test, but it's only taking Canadian orders for now. And that is our introduction to the expert we've invited to share our program this morning. Dr. Christopher Labos is back with us, an epidemiologist and a cardiologist based in Montreal. He has a medical podcast as well called The Body of Evidence. Morning, Dr. Labos. Good morning. I want to uh, to get your take on this uh, already, Dr. Labos, the Spartan Cube, if we can bring back pictures of this. As I mentioned, just approved by Health Canada over the weekend, shipped out already, and Manitoba is starting to validate it. Can you explain how the Spartan Cube works? Yeah, so it looks as if the technology they're using is very similar to the technology that we're already using for the regular uh, uh, nasal pharyngeal swabs that people are getting to be tested for COVID-19. The, the main advantage of this testing system, though, um, is that, one, it's portable, and two, that you can get the results back a lot quicker. So rather than waiting 24, 48, 72 hours to get the results back, uh, you'll get the results back almost immediately. The other big advantage is that rather than you having to go to the testing center, now the testing center can come to you. Now, when you live in a large city, maybe that's less important, but when you're talking about remote communities, uh, that's actually gonna be a, a huge advantage because right now, a lot of places have to fly their results and their samples back down to the main lab if the main lab is far away, wait for the results before they get the information they need. So if you have these type of portable rapid testing centers and you can bring them directly into, let's say a long-term care facility, test everyone in one shot, and now you have a much better idea of who's positive, who's negative, and then you can isolate people properly. So it makes the whole process a lot easier. It's Lorraine Charbonneau writing that she received the throat swab in the emergency room and she got a negative test result two days later, but she still was told to self-isolate for 14 days. And when she asked why, she was told that this test is not, or the test that she received, the throat swab, uh, is not 100% accurate. Um, what are the issues with accuracy? So the unfortunate reality is that no test is 100% accurate. You're always going to have false positives and false negatives. It's always possible that when you do the test, they won't find traces of the virus. Sometimes it's due to technical issues. Um, sometimes if they, if they test you very, very early or very, very late in the course of your disease, um, traces of the virus may either not have appeared yet or may have started to disappear. So people who get tested many, many days after their symptoms started uh, may not have any traces of the virus in, the, in their sputum or in their other secretions. So you always have to be conscious of the fact that tests are not perfect, and you have to look at the whole clinical scenario of the patient. The, the old adage of, you know, treat the patient, not the test, holds true. If you see somebody who has a fever, a cough, shortness of breath, who came into contact with somebody who had COVID-19, you should probably assume it's COVID-19 even if the test comes back negative. And of course, the other issue is, is that people are still getting sick from other stuff. So even if you don't have COVID-19, but you have the flu, you have some other virus, it's good advice to stay home anyway. So re remember that we have to put things into a clinical context. Wondering about that with Canada looking like it's, there are some encouraging signs about this whole business and the attempt to flatten the curve. Look down the line with me if this is um, possible, if it is in fact borne out. After Canada passes the peak and people really start to talk about being able to reopen, reopen the economy, start to return to some degree of normalcy, whatever this normal is. But what does the role of testing, because that's our focus today, what does the role of testing become at that point? 
Right. So once businesses start to reopen, once schools start to reopen, it's very possible that you're going to see an increase in cases. Maybe not a huge surge, but you are going to see, you know, more people get infected. And then how we test and how we isolate people is going to be key. One of the big problems with this virus when it first spread uh, across the globe is that many people were caught flat footed. Many people, especially in the U.S., they didn't have adequate testing kits. Nobody was really sure. There was, I think, an underappreciation of how many people could be asymptomatic with the virus. So, you know, most countries had a fairly limited testing strategy, and that probably allowed a lot of people to go undiagnosed. Now, if we, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry, I was going to say, but now, yes. But now, but now I think the things have changed. We've contained the virus, the healthcare system is not in crisis. We now are going to have an adequate number of testing kits. And so the situation is going to be a little bit different and we can be much more aggressive. We can test much more widely. And there it's going to be critical that we test and isolate. So if we want to prevent things like outbreaks in long-term care facilities, as, as, as you've been reporting all morning. Once you have one case, it's going to be important to test everybody and then isolate everybody who tests positive. And that's where you need not just access to testing kits, but also rapid testing kits. That's why these rapid kits are going to be so important, because if you can test everybody and get the results within an hour, uh, that's going to be a lot more helpful than, you can, than you, if you have to wait three days. So it's going to be about testing people, but then also contact testing. So testing one person and then testing everybody they've come into contact with, whether it be at home or at work, That's and then isolating them if they're positive. Ken Yando wondering whether you think federal and provincial governments drop the ball by not testing all employees who work at long-term care homes in Canada, uh, bearing in mind it's a provincial jurisdiction. And what would you recommend to fix the infection rates in these facilities? Yeah, so I mean, to, to say that people drop the ball is maybe a little bit uncharitable. I think many governments across the world were caught by surprise. I think we have to admit that the Canadian governments and the provincial governments in Canada all did pretty well, all things considered. Um, the, the problem with testing was that it's actually very hard to test people. You need a lot of kits, you need personnel to do the test, you know. So people have been talking about, well, let's test everybody in Canada. Remember, to date, we've only tested a little bit over 400,000 people in this country, and we're a country of 38 million people. So to test widely and to test generally is actually very difficult. What you actually need to do is test selectively and then isolate the people who test positive and then do the contact tracing that we talked about in, in the last segment. When you have one person who tests positive, you then go out and test every person that they come into contact with. So when we want to look at high-risk institutions like long-term care facilities, what would be the best strategy is um, you make sure that you test all the healthcare with all the healthcare workers who are working there to make sure they're not bringing the virus in. And then if you have somebody who tests positive, then test everyone in that facility and then isolate them. But the best way to prevent the spread of a virus is to isolate everybody. And then, of course, practice all the stuff, the most important thing, which is hand washing, proper sanitation, make sure things are cleaned and wiped down so that you prevent the transmission from one person to another. The problem with these facilities, just like in, on cruise ships, when you have a, a lot of people in a small contained space, it's very easy for the virus to spread from person to person unless you can really isolate people and sort of draw a barrier in institution in some way. So that's probably the best advice going forward. I'll, I'll get to testing and tracing because that's really our focus this morning, but that gets to treatment. And McMaster University, mm -hmm. I know, is really leading a huge worldwide research project into that kind of treatment we were just hearing about where they take the plasma from somebody who has survived and recovered from COVID-19 and then use it for someone who is battling COVID-19. Can you just talk about that part of the research and where things stand and the potential of it? Yeah, so the idea there is exactly as you said, somebody gets COVID-19, they recover, they've made antibodies. And so what you want to do is you want to get these people to donate their blood. You filter out all the red and white blood cells and you're left with the plasma that has the antibodies. And then you can do a transfusion of this plasma. And so you're essentially giving antibodies to somebody who's fighting the infection with the hope that the antibodies are going to help them fight off the infection faster. It's an interesting idea. It's been done before with various other diseases. It's called, you know, um, uh, passive immunity. So uh, it's certainly, th th there's certainly a rationale for it. We'll have to see how effective it is. Uh, it's going to have a few limitations. One is, first of all, you need enough people to have recovered from COVID-19. And so we're only starting now to get enough people 
have recovered to be able to, to get them to donate blood. The second sort of limitation is these people need to be able to donate blood. They can't have some sort of underlying medical illness that would prevent them from donating blood. Uh, and third, and probably the one that's going to be the most uh, challenging uh, obstacle to overcome is how many doses are you going to be able to get from every individual? So if every person can only donate enough blood to generate enough antibodies for one or two people to get a transfusion, that may not be a large scale therapy that we can apply to everyone for logistical reasons. So uh, it, it's an interesting therapy. It's being studied. We'll see how effective it is too. We still don't have any concrete data to show that it really makes a huge difference in people's recovery. Uh, but if it does, it might be useful, at least on a small scale, maybe to help treat the more serious cases that are in hospital. Uh, question from Catherine and Michael Hansen. And I think they must have a healthcare background, Dr. Lavros, because from what they understand, they write, the proper procedure for the NP swab, so I'm thinking that's nasopharyngeal, correct? That's exactly, so in the yeah. nose, will create discomfort and make the eyes water. Yeah. Is it possible that some of the false negatives that we've been talking about this morning mm -hmm. could be improper testing not fully into that NP space and not left yeah. in long enough? I mean, it's certainly possible. It's, 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 it's certainly possible, right? Uh, that's that's I, the, 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 What's probably the, the biggest factor, though, is something I mentioned before. It's the timing of the test. Because for a, a lot of people in various provinces, they had to wait to get tested because governments were were uh, you know uh, increasing their test their testing capability. Uh, d there's I think some evidence now to suggest that if you only get tested three or four or five or a week after your symptoms start, your levels are going to be lower and maybe that's why you're getting false negative tests. But technique is probably a, a certain part of it as well. So that's why we are probably underreporting cases a little bit. And that's where, if we start doing large-scale antibody testing, serologic testing, we might get a better idea of whether people were affected or not. Really interesting scenario raised by Karen, one of our viewers, who writes that she works in a family physician's office, Dr. Labros, where they perform pregnancy tests daily. They had to stop using the rapid response pregnancy test kits because they were grossly inaccurate. I'm reading her words here, mostly giving a false negative result. Her point is this, if they can't get a simple pregnancy test correct, how can you trust the results for something as critical as COVID-19? Many people could be walking around with a false sense of security with that false negative test result. Yeah, so I mean, so, so, so there's an important point raised there, raised there is that tests are not perfect. Now, the pregnancy test and the COVID-19 test are, are very, very different in terms of their, their biochemistry. With a pregnancy test, you're testing for uh, a, a particular hormone that's released in, preg in pregnancy, whereas with COVID-19, what you're testing for is using a PCR test where you're trying to amplify the RNA to detect traces of RNA from the virus. Um, but the, the underlying point is a sound one. Tests are not perfect. And that you know different companies make different tests with varying degrees of accuracy spain had uh, i believe an issue a few weeks back where they tried to roll out a rapid screening test that turned out to be less than uh, ideal and so they had to pull that back uh, and the u.s in the early days one of the issues that led to their inability to test widely was the fact that they tried to develop a new test that also ended up being slightly inaccurate so we have to remember that just because a test exists doesn't mean it's, it, it works that it's actually 100% accurate or close to 100% accurate. So that's why, I mean, that, that's exactly why we have this system in place with Health Canada to grant approval to tests once they can review the data and be sure that they're actually you know, uh, properly effective. Uh, Jeff Tether writing in, how close are we to being able to test for antibodies to see if people are developing them yet and how long could that take? So a question about those serological tests. I know they're, they're beginning a big study in the United States based out of Michigan, but how close are we to seeing that in wide use? So the test already exists. People are doing it. They're mainly doing it in, as part of research protocols. It's not being rolled out clinically just yet. Uh, I don't really know. I'm, I'm certain that's something that, the, that uh, Health Canada is thinking about. Uh, how widely they're going to use it and in what capacity they're going to use it remains to be seen. I suspect that within the next couple of weeks, maybe in the next month, as people start talking about lifting the restrictions and uh, opening things up, that we're going to see how exactly antibody testing is rolled out. It's probably going to be used in some capacity, but I don't even think the government at this point knows exactly how it's going to be using it just yet. 
Dwayne has a question based on some of the things we're hearing internationally. The reports out of South Korea about people becoming reinfected after they have recovered apparently from COVID-19. Certainly the WHO is studying this recovered patients who seem to be reinfected. What might that tell us? So there's a couple of possible explanations. One is that these people didn't develop immunity uh, after their infection and got reinfected. So that's possibility one. Uh, possibility two is that the, the, the test was wrong. So we've been talking about false negatives, but false positives can also happen. Um, but possibility three is that just because you can find traces of viral RNA in secretions doesn't mean you're still sick. So again, the old adage is treat the patient, not the test. Um, if you've very clearly recovered from your infection, if you had fever, cough, shortness of breath, you tested positive, and now you've recovered, and the test was repeated for some reason, it came back positive. If you're clinically better, it's very possible that all we're seeing is just, you know, traces of the, the virus still in your secretions, but it doesn't mean you're still infectious. It doesn't necessarily mean you've gotten reinfected. So nobody's, you know, entirely certain what these, you know, uh, positive retests really mean. We'll see with time. Um, but it's important not to overinterpret and overanalyze what are admittedly just sort of, you know, exceptional cases. The vast majority of people uh, do recover and do end up testing negative afterwards. Deb wrote to tell us about her daughter. Her test came back as indeterminate. We've been talking about false positives and false negatives this morning, but this is an indeterminate result. And she's wondering whether her daughter should be retested even though her symptoms are beginning to abate. Yeah, it's an interesting question, and I'm not sure we know what the correct answer in that sort of situation is. Certainly, if there's an ability to retest and there's a clinical desire to clarify the diagnosis, then yes, you can certainly do that, and that will at least tell you if it was COVID-19 or something else. Um, if you are getting better, though, there is obviously a, an argument to be made for just wait it out, you will recover. Um, because it's possible that the test result won't actually change treatment, right? If your test is positive, you will be told, stay home until you get better. And if your test is negative, it'll be, well, you probably had something else, stay home until you get better. So if testing doesn't actually change your behavior, what you're going to do with the result, then it doesn't actually serve a purpose. And that's one of the arguments against this idea of, well, let's test everybody. And it's, no, we should test people if the test result is going to change how we're going to behave. That's interesting, and it leads right into the question from Mark that I was going to put you put to you, given that anyone who has the virus can be symptom or asymptomatic. We talked about earlier how they may have a higher viral load just before starting to show symptoms, or tests negative can uh, contract the virus at any time. And then, as we've just talked about, becoming reinfected after potentially recovering, as some indications in South Korea. Should we not have a regimen of periodic testing for everyone? What's the argument for and against that one? Well, again, if we had unlimited resources and you could do this easily, then, then yes, there would be some value to it. The problem is, is the logistics. Uh, it's not feasibly possible to test every single person in this country. We are a country of 38 million people. Uh, we simply, right now, can just can't do that many tests. So it's more useful to use our resources to test the people who are at high risk. So if we ever open up the borders, people coming back from overseas, people who develop symptoms, and then using the contact tracing. Once you find one positive test, you test everybody around that person. And then for all of those who test positive, you test everybody around that new person. And so you follow the chain of infection to try to limit its spread. That's where it becomes useful. And that's where countries like South Korea uh, performed so well and limited their spread because of it. So it's, it's about testing the right people uh, because, you know, uh, unfortunately, resources are limited. A final question, and it's from Dado, and it has to do with somebody who has been tested and now wondering at the end of it all, positive with COVID, tested as positive, and then negative after that 14-day period. Will he still be someone who can uh, spread coronavirus? So it, it's an interesting question because, again, we don't have clear answers. There have been reports of people sh having traces of virus in their secretions in their stool for a couple of weeks. Some reports have suggested up to three weeks, and I think there was one report that suggested up to a month uh, after symptom uh, onset or symptom resolution, depending on how the studies were done. 
So it's not entirely clear. Just because you can find traces of the virus doesn't mean you're still infectious. If people want to play it safe and you have the capacity to stay home, probably not a bad idea to stay home for an extra one, two, three, even four weeks if you can, uh, just you know, under the principle of an abundance of caution. But it's not clear when your infectivity period ends. The general consensus is that you're most infectious right at the beginning of the illness, and then your ability to infect others drops off with time, but nobody knows where that end point is. Thank you for all of the questions again this morning. Dato, your final one. And uh, Dr. Labos, just a pleasure to have you back with us again today. We hope you'll return. We have many more questions to answer, and um, we'll look forward to our next meeting. Christopher Labos, an epidemiologist and cardiologist in Montreal.